Welcome to Bitter Reality Brewing. Yep, you know, I always share, so a beer that actually turned me on to Belgian IPAs, which is something we're going to be brewing today, but we're going to be brewing a very special Belgian IPA. This is a Night on Ponce. It's an IPA from Three Taverns. Got my Three Taverns shirt on. Yes, I picked that up when I was in Atlanta. It's just a great, great IPA. It's got the Belgian yeast going nuts. So I have a bunch of testing. And like I said, I now have two Anvil foundries, so I'm very excited. And I decided, I was listening to a YouTuber recently say something and said it was kind of a myth. So, hmm, you know, I question that. And I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So here we go. Before I jump into everything, don't forget like, subscribe, keep sharing. Definitely appreciate the support out there. It's been huge. Definitely appreciate the support. As you've been watching, I've been doing some book giveaways. I'm trying to pay it back. And I've got many, many more kinds of contests coming between now and Christmas. And hopefully we can kick it off with a little bang around Christmas. But keep watching, keep checking out the videos. Definitely share, I appreciate it very much. The first test is something somebody put to me, and it was a viewer, subscriber, whatever you want to say, and I do listen. And if you give me a suggestion for a video, I write it down. Doesn't mean I'm gonna do it tomorrow, doesn't mean I'm gonna do it this year, but I'm probably gonna eventually do it, especially if I tell you I like it. I, it's one of the things, if you say something, you know, I'll question it, we'll work it out. But if you just say it and it makes perfect sense or I think it's a great idea, I'm just gonna tell you straight up, I'm gonna note it down, and that means I'm looking to do it in the future. His suggestion, was that, or should I say, his suggestion and the reason for his suggestion was that the Anvil Foundry and several other of the all-in-one brewing systems out there have a great deal of dead space between the actual grain basket and the actual boil system or, you know, whatever you want to call it, but the boiling vessel or the vessel that holds the actual wort or water and his suggestion to fix that was to simply lift the grain basket all the way to the top after about 15 minutes and set it back down. Basically, it creates a suction on the bottom, gets the wort to move around and frees up any water that could be on the sides that isn't flowing with the natural flow of the recirculation. That's one of the reasons recirculation to me is huge. And I know some people will just say, yeah, I'll save the hundred bucks. But to me, don't save the hundred bucks, just buy it, trust me, you're gonna need it. It works for so many things between the recirculation to transferring the wart. I think I would lose my mind without that recirculation. <laughs> I don't know how I would get through a brew day. Just saying, uh, I'd have to brew at a very high shelf, so I, you know, high level shelf so I could get some gravity, but the theory is, is that there's a lot of dead space. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to brew on two anvils the exact same recipe on both. And I'm going to take that grain basket out. It's going to be a 90 minute mash and a 90 minute boil. I'm debating because we're doing 75 minutes at about 150 Fahrenheit. So my theory is, is that maybe I'll do it several times and I'll document it. I'm debating between doing it two times to as many as four times, just to ensure the wart moves. On the other anvil, not this one, this is going to be another test. We're going to take that anvil and we're not gonna play with it. We're just gonna let it go on as usual, no big deal. I have my hydrometer from Brewing America that lets me take hydrometer readings at 155 Fahrenheit. So I'm gonna pull some hydrometer readings from this one and that one, try to document it, figure out exactly where we're at, see if changing you know, throughout that time, the 15, if I do it 30, 45, 60, whatever, if I do it at those increments, does it continue to increase or does it stay the same? Or does it increase at all, even maybe from one of those, pull it out, set it back down. That's all he suggested was pull it out, set it back down. That allows the wort to move around and clears out any water that's sitting in the side that's not recirculating through the grains. Very, very simple in my eyes. But I wanna make sure that was very clear so you understand the test. The second test, and it'll be in the part two, but the second test, maybe a part three, I don't know. But yeah, probably a part two, is that Anvil was awesome. I mean, beyond any expectation and hooked me up with an Anvil Crucible conical fermenter. Yes, top of the line, very affordable if you're talking a 
conical fermenter. You know, and I have said it and I've heard other people say it, it's relative based on someone's financial standing, but yeah, I'm sorry. You're not gonna get anything of that quality. That, it just, amazing. So we're going to take one batch and we're gonna ferment it in the conical fermenter. That will be our status quo, should we say. Then we're gonna ferment the other one in our Firmzilla All-Rounder under pressure. My standard that I'm coming up with is putting it under five PSI and then allowing it to ramp up to 10 and leaving it alone. The key, and this was mentioned by Dr. Hans, gotta give him some credit here, but he mentioned that pressure fermentation does not necessarily subdue the esters or phenols when you're fermenting beer. Most people tell me that they're fermenting 3470 lager strain, which is for higher temp lagers. And it does reduce those off flavors, which it doesn't matter if it's an ester or a phenol in my eyes. And I know esters are usually more preferred than phenols, but like a, a Hefeweizen, from my understanding, the banana is an ester, the clove is a phenol. Now, a lot of the phenols are very negative, band-aid, th things you don't want to taste. So subduing those, it's not being picky. It's not saying, hey, I'm only subduing those nasty flavors <laughs> and aromas. I'm just subduing them. I'm keeping them under pressure and it's reducing the ability for that yeast to produce those esters or phenols. So his theory is, is that it doesn't do that. I've heard so many people tell me it does. I don't know. My mom's from Missouri. I'm a show me person too. So I'm from Florida, but hey, I wanna see it for myself. So we're gonna ferment the same beer from two different anvils, same exact recipe, one under pressure, one not, and we'll see. Maybe there's a major difference. Maybe I end up with 10 gallons of the same exact beer and just ferment it differently, we'll see. But here's the recipe, I'm just calling a Belgian rye IPA, and I was playing around with the pale ale, I was playing around with two different recipes, but the problem with two different recipes is that if I modify the hops, and that was the only thing I was gonna modify, it could impact the aromas, it could impact what I smell, and I don't want it to. So we're gonna keep the hops identical, coming out of the same lots and the same packets and everything. I'll go over the recipe really quick. And yes, it's late at night, that's why I'm having this. And we'll be brewing first thing in the morning, crack of dawn, it'll seem like the same time, but it's all good. So we're doing a five gallon batch on an anvil foundry, two of them. Same time, I will stagger them about 20 minutes apart because I can't do everything at the exact same time and I don't have help, so it is what it is, but close enough. I'm following a very similar recipe to the Raging Itch, we'll put it to put it politely, um, from Flying Dog, amazing beer. But I'm keeping the ABV down and I'm, I'm modifying it a little bit. But needless to say, we got four pounds of two row, brewer's malt, pale ale, whatever you wanna call it. Um, get four pounds of Maris Otter, two pounds of rye malt. That's not in Flying Dog, that's me, I love my rye. One pound, four ounces of honey biscuit. And that's from Black Swan or Swan, however you wanna say it. That's also another modification, but I really wanna get a little hint of sweet and I wanna add a little bit of more of that bready biscuit um, flavor and aroma, so we're there. We've got four ounces of acid malt. That'll bring us down to almost an exact 5.2 pH. And I've been noticing that Beersmith is pretty good, but I've noticed that Brewfather is almost dead on for my pHs. When I take a pH, and it says I should have a certain pH, it usually nails it. So I'm quite impressed with that. Um, then we have four ounces of caramel or crystal malt 60L. That is part of the flying dog, but that's just to give us some color. Now the hops. Yeah, I've got too many hops, so I'm not even gonna waste my time and I'm just gonna throw a ton of hops in there and we're still gonna be sitting at, if I remember right, 58.5 IBUs, theoretically. And I'm looking down here and I'm seeing a, a, a a hop that I don't remember putting in, but I must have changed my mind at the last minute, and I think I did. So needless to say, I haven't, uh, all of these are 10 minute additions. 10 minute additions. I have one ounce of Apollo, one ounce of Idaho number seven. It's gonna do Simcoe, and I changed my mind to Idaho seven and back and forth and back and forth, and I guess I final, finally ended up on Idaho seven. So we got one ounce of Apollo, one ounce of Idaho seven, one ounce of Mosaic, one ounce of Saz, yeah, I know, and you're thinking, Saz, why? 
I'm going for something very distinct. I want spice and I want a little bit of citrus and a little bit of pine. So the pine and spice is where I'm kind of leaning to and I'm grabbing a tiny bit of tropical over there, but I really want to focus on the spice. And then I'm looking at using Belgian Ardans Weist Labs 3522. I'm looking at my yeast starters and my 550 and my three taverns. Yes, I stole some of their yeast many years ago and I've been keeping it alive and still smells pretty good. So our 558 and our three taverns is our backup, but I do have the 3522 and I have two starters going. They just aren't quite producing quite as well as the other ones. So I'm a little concerned, but I'm still leaning that way because when I made the Flying Dog clone last year, it was amazing. I wish I would have had the ABV a little lower. I would have slammed through that. Still slammed through it probably a little too fast, but hey, it was amazing. And that's it. I mean, we got 6.6 .6 gallons of water. We're gonna drop a gallon of water at the end for the sparge. I've got my brewing salts. We'll go over those later. And nothing special. I mean, the beer is only going to be expected ABV of around 6.5 to possibly 7.2 if I get a better final gravity than what Beersmith thinks it's going to be. So I know it'll be in the morning, but let's get brewing. I know you're thinking, wait, the background changed. His hair got shorter. What just happened? I got good news and bad news. It's all in how you look at it, but there's going to have to be a three part video. So this will be part one. Part two is the brew day because the brew day was just an extremely long day doing two brews back to back. I'm editing the hell out of it, trying to reduce it down, but I don't want to leave any key parts out. Learned a ton, and I do mean learned a ton, proved some cool things to my content. I will have to do it several times to prove it to everybody probably. And then part three, of course, will be the final taste testings to compare the esters and phenols and all those lovely things between a non-pressure and a pressure fermenter. But yeah, it was a huge day. I learned a lot. I didn't get burnt. I didn't get rained on. Uh, with a little tan there for a while, but it's all good. Thank you again for joining us here at Bitter Reality Brewing. Don't forget, like, subscribe, keep sharing. And don't forget part two and part three, I mean massive. Thanks again.